Paper and Objects Conservation Studio. Uh, very recently opened practice after 12 years at Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Huntington Library Art Collections and Botanical Gardens. Jennifer Kim is currently the Objects Conservator at the Autry Museum of the American West, um, and she previously held conservation, conservation positions at the Archaeological Exploration of Sardis, Turkey, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So I'm going to um, actually share the presentation for them. And Jennifer Kim will get us started. Right now. Um, just a quick note uh, that I failed to mention before we begin. Um, there have been many requests to record these sessions. Um, and unfortunately for, for many of our sessions due to, due to copyright permissions on images, um, we weren't able to record, but this one we are going to be recording um and so uh just bear that in mind um if you're in the audience okay jen are you ready yeah um hi everyone thank you so much for joining us i hope you know this is going to be a really productive session for everybody um so in this session, we're going to be focusing on uh, general guidance on preserving your artwork um, by understanding how specific environmental, biological, and human factors contribute to the longevity and the condition of your works. Um, and that's like, regardless of whether it's on display or just stored in your home um, or other storage unit, whatever, whatever uh, setting you have your, um, your portfolio and work stored. Um, we'll also try to help out uh, with uh, how to take sort of that, un that broader understanding of how these factors work and use it to help you make smart risk assessment uh, um, and improve your personal collections care practice. Um, so with the first slide, uh, when we're speaking of preservation, um, our goal is to mitigate or slow the deterioration of materials. And um, just to start, this is a list of main contributors to accelerated de uh, deterioration that hopefully will spur some ideas for questions. The bulk of our session we're hoping will be Q&A. And so we're gonna kind of go over some of these topics as, as a little conversation starters um, because I, you know, everyone's situation is so different. You know, everyone works in different media, their storage situation, their studio situation. It's, it's, all, there's, it's all so varied that, you know, it, there's no way we can sit here and prescribe something that'll work across the board for everybody. Um, but it, just going through this uh, initial list of uh, agents of deterioration, um, I also wanna mention that some of these topics are probably gonna be, or some of the topics that may come up here will also be covered in other sessions. So there may be times when people might be interested in sort of a little more detail that we might def defer to another session that's coming up, particularly packing, which is something that I think there's a lot of crossover here. Um, so let's see if we can start just with the first um, agent deterioration we're talking about physical damage or loss. So this is just like any sort of accident, shipping damage, earthquake, theft. Um, that's like a sort of immediate uh, physical deterioration of your artwork, pretty instant. Um, the second is fire and smoke damage. And Erin, do you wanna just sort of clarify really quickly the sort of difference, the specific difference between fire and smoke damage? Oh, uh, yeah, well, uh, if you do have a fire, um, you're, uh, so you, you can get smoke damage uh, in the form of black, uh, uh, things on your artwork. Uh, and then if things start to burn, uh, then you get uh, major damage. And uh, so things that are completely burned, you can't uh, really do very much about. Uh, but uh, things that do have uh, soot uh, sh should be removed. Um, and uh, it should be removed more quickly rather than later. Uh, the longer it is on the object, the uh, more difficult it is 
uh, to remove. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So when we're dealing with like sort of considering the risk of fire damage, it's it's not just limited to like things burning up, but it's like the sort of peripheral damage that happens from that fire incident. You know. Um, so your your apartment might not be the building that catches or the unit that catches on fire but if your neighbor's apartment catches on fire you can still have a like a, a, a huge amount of smoke damage um into your unit and all of your works and everything could be sort of damaged so i mean these are sort of the kinds of things that we think about as factors um when we're uh assessing risks to collections at least at larger institutions then it's something that you can apply to your smaller situation um, another uh, sort of ever-present threat is uh, water damage, and this could be either from like a, a like a large flood. It could be a small leak. You know, a tiny leak can still cause like a great deal of damage. Um, it can be water from ongoing irrigation. If your artwork is up in a um, outdoor space adjacent to a lawn, and there's just constant irrigation going on there, that that's going to be a long-term uh, source of of the deterioration for your artwork because that 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 tap water coming out of that irrigation is not going to be it, it could lead to anything from like you know hard water stains corrosion on like metal sculptures things like that so you know that's another sort of example of um water damage um another sort of common uh, agent of deterioration is just pollutants and these could be pollutants that are coming from, you know, the environment. Like we all think of things like smog or um, uh, you know, just general air pollution, but it can also be a pollutant that's coming from the material itself, which is something that's referred to as an inherent vice. So um, the the pollutant, the the material that you're trying to preserve could be creating its own pollutant that then exacerbates its own deterioration, and um, one example of that would be uh, is nitrocellulose, which is, you know, sort of famously known to be an item or a material that's in a lot of collections because it's this early photographic medium, um, but it also generates, it, it, what's the word, it's combustible and um, also generates, sorry, Erin, I'm blanking, which acid does it generate? Oh, uh, nit nitric acid. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> It will, so it will, it, it, uh, it, it exacerbates its own degradation um, because it suffers from this inherent vice. And that's something in the, and I guess in Lestarcia's presentation, she, she probably spoke to a lot more about why it's so important when you're selecting your materials as an artist to sort of think about these things. I mean, that may be a conscious choice that you want to make, that I want my artwork to deteriorate in this particular way. But if you're trying to not do that, then, you know, um, something to consider. Um, another uh, really important agent of deterioration to consider is pests. Um, and actually, you know, let's move on to the, well, let's, let's just run through these last few really quickly because we have more specific slides about them. So pollutants, pests, and we're talking about mammal or insect, um, light ac um, across the spectrum, and then uh, uh, incorrect temperature and relative humidity or sudden and drastic changes in temperature and relative humidity. So let's let's go over these last four a little more in detail. So, um, well, we, okay, so we talked a little bit about pollutants and inherent vice. Um, um, let's see, it, in addition to pollutants from the environment and pollutants from the object itself, you can have pollutants coming from sort of the immediate environment and you know, one example of this is um, from improper storage or display. And one of the, uh, Aaron, if you want to talk about matte burn a little bit. Oh, uh -huh. I actually have another, I added uh, oh, okay. some images so I can talk about that later. Okay, yeah. so we'll come back to matte burn, which is a very particular um, type of, I, I just think it's important to go over because I'm sure many people work in 2D <laughs> media. Um, but that's an example of where it's the immediate housing surrounding the object that's creating the pollutant and damaging the work. So we just have a few examples here of at the bottom right is nitrocellulose. 
like you talked about as um, sort of as self exacerbating uh, in inherent vice. And then on the left, we have an example of this is the base of a bronze sculpture. And the pollutant in this case was a soda that someone had spilled onto it. And there's actually quite a lot of acids and other um, material <laughs> ingredients in soda that uh, you know, because it went sort of unnoticed initially because the soda dried and so it didn't seem like a problem, but the residue was still there and it, it, it caused all this sort of uh, corrosion and the changing of the patina into this like really inappropriate um, green uh, uh, verdigris type uh, corrosion product. So that was that was something that we you know really couldn't reverse all we could do was to sort of try to you know get off the pollutant so that it didn't continue to exacerbate that damage and then um tone it back and mask it as best we could and protect it so that it didn't continue to deteriorate in this rather hideous splattered way um and then on the upper right is just an example of um you can see that the, the center, it's actually damage on a marble column, but because of the damage, you can see the color the marble is supposed to be, which is that light brown. And then you can see this ahead of um, bleached and how much just crud there is on it. <laughs> so um, let's see. I um, just wanted to mention that uh, that in terms of, control or trying to mitigate or um, grapple with uh, dealing with environmental pollutants. Uh, there are a variety of ways that you can control the microenvironment by improving the housing or exhibition condi uh, conditions. And in terms of inherent vice, something like nitrocellulose, you, you can't really get rid of the pollutant because it's in the object. But there, I mean, if you really wanted to get super fancy, there are theoretically ways of like, slowing down that degradation, but that gets a little bit fancier. Um, and, you know, you could use sort of oxygen scavengers to create a low oxygen environment. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot of times nitrocellulose is stored in sub-zero freezing temperatures to also slow degradation. Um, but that gets, that gets pretty fancy and a little elaborate pretty quickly. And that's the sort of thing that is typically done more within an institution. It's a, but I mean, there are ways you can, you know, if you have one little tiny precious thing, we can talk a little bit about oxygen scavengers, but that does get a little more complicated if we wanna move on to the next slide. Um, so these are sort of an example of the grossest pests that I think are that, they're called the dirty dozen. The next slide actually is the dirty dozen. But um, just really quickly, I grouped these into types of materials. And I wanted to point you to this website, museumpests.net, because I just think it's a really great free resource for um, help identifying uh, a pest if you, you're dealing with an infestation and also just sort of strategies for mitigating or preventing. Uh, infestation. So on the upper left, you have a couple of different types of clothes eating moths. Um, you can see webbing clothes moth, and then a case making moth, and then a variegated carpet beetle. And these will eat all like your textiles that are woolens and silks and other pertinacious materials. They'll infest hair also, um, all kinds of organic materials like that. On the upper right, we have sort of the pests that attack wood. So you have your powder post beetle, um, there's a dry wood termite there up, up at the top and, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking, powder post beetle. <laughs> what is that last guy? Um, wood boring beetle, excuse me. <laughs> and they, those both will leave tunnels. So oftentimes you won't see those bottom two. Sometimes you'll see termites hanging out, but those bottom two, you'll never see them. They live inside the wood, but you'll find little tiny holes in your wood and um, oftentimes little pyramidal sh shaped piles of pa uh, brown powder and it's their poop, which is basically just wood at, in tiny pellet form. On the bottom left, it's uh, book lice and silverfish. Erin, do you wanna talk about them a, 
for a sec. Uh, yeah, I do have a couple of images of uh, what the damage looks like, uh, but uh, they will eat paper. And uh, actually, if we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, this is the dirty dustin that uh, Jennifer, Jennifer mentioned. And uh, I thought this was super adorable. Uh, I was like, oh, a dirty dozen of museum insects. And uh, uh, maybe that's a crazy con like conservator think thing to think, um, like this is really cute. Uh, but my three-year-old really likes looking at these. And uh, when you are dealing with a investigation, um, you really need to know what uh, is in your lab or uh, wherever you're working. And uh, uh, so you can look, um, uh, at this website and uh, specifically these uh, these insects uh, are the most um, prevalent. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, once you know what you're dealing with, uh, then you can start uh, to do something about it. Yeah. So, and then if we, if on the last slide, on the, the last group that we had were the sort of, um, pests that aren't necessarily eating your materials, but they're still destroying your materials by, you know, defecating on it. So, you know, uh, pigeons obviously do a ton of damage to outdoor sculpture, for example, you know, their, their poop is just, you know, very damaging to all kinds of um, stones and bronzes, they can stain or exacerbate degradation. And then same with mice, you know, they, they're they poop and pee and both of those like waste materials can really um, hurt the artwork. And in addition to that, they tend to make nests, which is super gross and not fun to deal with, but it does happen. And then Erin, you have a horrible story about cockroaches. Oh. You wouldn't think that they do <laughs> that much, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I was actually just thinking about that. Um, I was once working on um, a very large object uh, and its value was upwards of a million dollars. And um, it was a very dark area we were working in. And uh, so we left the object overnight. And when we uh, got back in the morning, uh, there was a cockroach um, that was uh, actively dying on the artwork. And uh, I guess it was defecating or all these liquids were, you know, Thing coming out from its body. Um, and so it uh, was leaking all over this million dollar object. And uh, thankfully we were able to remove everything because it was a painted uh, surface. Um, but uh, after that, we did not put any artwork uh, in that room. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, it, it's not necessarily that the pest is eating, actively eating your artwork, they can still sort of cause a lot of um, collateral damage just by living there or dying there as the case may be. Um, so, uh, and actually I should say rats do eat some materials too, especially if they're building a nest, they'll, they'll chew up stuff. Um, I think we're ready for the, well, this is uh, the next slide. So we just really quickly over lighting. Um, I mean, this is probably going to be talked about in several other sessions, the sort of uh, long-term damage that uh, constant light exposure can cause in the form of, you know, fading and just, you know, accelerated degradation. Um, and this is something that can happen not just from, you know, outdoor UV light that has high UV levels, but even just interior, like, visible light, so just a regular light bulb. Uh, can cause uh, fading. It just takes a little bit longer, but um, in general, you know, most institutions they have, they sort of have little formulas of their own for how much exposure they're willing to let their artwork be out for, for a period of time before it has to come down and be rotated, particularly like sensitive materials such as paper and textiles and, you know, other organic materials. Obviously stone and metal objects they're not really it's, it's not much of a, as much of a concern and even oil paintings are actually pretty light fast but um you know this is just a very general guideline but and every institution is different and every institution takes different things into consideration too so there might be materials for example that are light sensitive and a lender wants to borrow it but 
you know, it, it was already on display for a long time, but it's a really important piece. It has really important significance, you know, and they may still be willing to go ahead and lend it um, if it's, if it, you know, because these things can't exist if no one knows they're there and they can never see them. So, you know, sometimes they'll bend the rules um, if it's really important, but, but they do long-term want to like have the stuff be around so that people can continue to see it. So um, these are just some general guidelines for lighting. Erin, did you have anything else about? Um, um, not really, I mean, uh, for works of art on paper um, and other things, you do want to get UV filtering plus helas and actually objects. I mean, any anytime uh, you do put something on exhibit, uh, UV filtering plexiglass is really important. Um, but I feel like that also gives people uh, a sense of security that really, uh, you can't, even if you block out UV visible light uh, can damage objects. And uh, uh, so if you are using like a felt tip marker or uh, something that is light sensitive, you just have to be really uh, aware of uh, what your exhibition space uh, it's like if you have uh, natural windows or light from uh... I think Erin froze. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I'll try to pick up where she was talking about if you have like natural light, you need to be able to block out those sources of natural light. Um, so if you have like a window that's letting in sunlight to like put up blinds or a scrim or something to um, block out some of that light. and. I see that there are a couple of questions too. Um, yeah, fluorescent lighting does have, um, is, is, is harmful uh, to works on paper. Um, I think, Erin, correct me if I'm wrong, but like fluorescent light also have light in the UV spectrum. Uh, yes. like I think it goes, yeah. yeah you, can actually, uh, you can buy uh, things to put over the lights uh, that will block UV and, um, uh, so I think you can purchase them online and uh, just put them over the poles and then you don't have to worry about the UV. Mm -hmm. But you'll still have to, you know, sort of be aware of how much just regular visible light in total the artwork, whether it's paper or textile is being exposed to, exposed to, not exposed, exposed to. Um, you know, a lot of that's just tracking. Just keep, keep in mind when you put it up and you know, so that you, you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's been up for six months. I should take it down, put something else up for a while. You know, let's put this back in the box. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you to uh, whoever posted the fluorescent light bulb filter <laughs> into the chat. There is a link for it. Um, oh, yes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone's asking about silverfish or fire brats. Silverfish are pretty hard to get rid of. Um, you can get boric acid traps. I think is one method. A, a, a lot of that, it, you know, for a lot of pest mitigation, um, sort of the safest and easiest thing you can do is just exclude them by like having your artwork wrapped very fully sealed in plastic. Um, so if you say have like a book, a box of books, and you know there's a bunch of silverfish living in there, I would just take out every object and clean it, vacuum around everything so that if there's any you know, silverfish hiding in there, you can get them out. And then I would probably repack them into a nice clean plastic bin and then just make sure it's like sealed all around. I would actually probably wrap it also in plastic sheeting and tape it up very well. And, and maybe check on it in another three to six months to make sure that you didn't miss any silverfish. Um, but yeah, with silverfish, they're just, it's really hard to just get rid of them forever. So exclusion is probably the safest bet. I don't know, Aaron. do you have other tips? <laughs> Not really. I mean, just uh, just always go through your area and um, you can put uh, insect uh, traps. Uh, I actually was gonna bring one out, but I didn't bring one. Uh, but just so I put, you should put those all over and um, those will get the solar fish. And uh, one thing is that you can do is uh, look in your traps every month. Uh, and if you notice that there are a lot of uh, insects in there, um, then uh, particularly solar fish, uh, then you know that um, you have a bigger issue. Um, and yeah, like Jen was talking about, just um, monitor her.
Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, someone else makes a great point that reducing relative humidity also helps slow down silverfish and carp. Uh, yeah, raised relative humidity actually always just um, exacerbate insect activity. It's kind of amazing how that happened. Um, in terms of essential oils, we, I don't use essential oils. I don't think I used, I try not to use anything that evolves a vapor or a scent. So um, I think at, at, at the museum where I work, for anything that can go, if something is invested, anything that can go into a, a freezer, uh, we use freezing at low temperature exposure to um, get rid of infestations when objects are coming into the building for the first time to make sure that we're not bringing an infestation in. So that's something that you can sort of be aware of too. Like if you're bringing in a bunch of, like say you work in found materials, if you are bringing in this like amazing haul of stuff that you got, you know, before you bring it into your house, go through everything and clean it, you know, um, because you know, that, that, that's the moment when you want to make sure you're not bringing anything in. Um, and also like at most institutions, you can't eat or drink in the storage areas because we, you want to just reduce the amount of um, basically buffet that's available to the pests. So, you know, that could, um, that's another practice that's pretty effective and monitoring as Aaron says. Um, uh, let's, someone's asking about uh, silica gel, but we're gonna talk about that a little later. So why don't we, maybe we keep going for a little bit and then, cause we're almost done with our slides at this point and then we'll just um, go to questions then. <laughs> How's that sound? Um, yeah, so temperature and relative humidity, the, um, uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, where was I? Uh, extremes in uh, relative humidity can be particularly dangerous. Um, temperature, there are some limits, but there's generally a bit more flexibility with temperature um, fluctuations. It's really the relative humidity and the effect that temp temperature changes can have on the relative humidity that causes the most severe damage to artwork. So, um, you know, you can have deterioration from mechanical stresses, like say if it was really dry and all your wood dried out, and then, or let's say it was all, it was really dry and then you were working and you had your wood out and then all of a sudden it just got super damp. Um, you might then see some sort of like stress cracking or something like that from like rapid expansion and contraction of like a material like wood that's porous and can take on moisture <clears throat> from the environment. Um, so there's like mechanical damage that can happen like that. There's also um, chemical processes that can uh, damage your materials uh, from like, for example, hydrolysis from relative humidity levels that are too high. Um, you know, some materials will just degrade more quickly um, in certain conditions. And then there are some materials that shouldn't be too dry. I think certain textiles, you don't want to see them super dried out. Um, and then uh, there's also always the risk of um, increased relative humidity causing an out, um, uh, an outbreak in mold infestation. There's mold all around us. There's just spores everywhere. They're just not active until you've reached like a high enough relative humidity for a long enough period of time. And then that's when they'll sort of kind of pop and start staining your artwork. Um, so, you know, a lot of it does really depend on the material, but generally trying to keep things between 40 and 60% is I think what most institutions aim for. Definitely want to keep it below 75%. That's when you're going to definitely start seeing some mold growth um, on organic materials. And even sometimes inorganic materials, Erin, you saw mold going on uh, Sintra. Oh, like yeah. Expanded okay. PVC foam. Yeah. I mean, I, so, I think it was mold. And uh, we, were, uh, we were thinking that uh, possibly water had come. Uh, into the plastic and then uh, an artist had painted over uh, the edge of the plastic and then uh, that might have gotten water also uh, into the substrate uh, and then you know it's a mold uh, that was growing on there and uh, yeah so mold can grow almost anywhere 
And um, yeah, you just have to be really wary of it. Mm -hmm. So like the first step really is to monitor what you're, I mean, if you want to be sort of organized about dealing with the situation, the first step is to start monitoring. And you can do that using like a, a, um, a data logger, for example, which is um, basically a thermohydro, a thermometer and a hygrometer, excuse me, hygrometer, but it's recording the, the readings that it's getting. So it's like throughout the day, it's periodically taking the temperature and, and um, taking the relative humidity and recording that information so that you can see over the period of like hours, days, weeks, months, years, how the humidity has fluctuated in a space so that, you know, sometimes people are really shocked to find out like, oh, we live in Los Angeles. Why are things, get, you know, it's really dry here. It's really hot. But it actually gets quite damp um, in Los Angeles at times. And so you can still sort of, and you know, depending on what your particular situation is um, within the building that you're in or just the part of town you're in, your biggest problem might be RH that's too high. And so you actually need to figure out a way to like bring down the relative humidity that your, your items are exposed to either through storage means or by controlling the climate. Um, so monitoring and tracking is key. Um, and the other great thing about monitoring is that if you're, if you actually have like a pretty stable climate, um, but then one day like your HVAC system just decides to like go on the fritz for a while, the only way you're gonna know that happened if it started back up is if you'd been monitoring. And so if you are monitoring and you see like, oh my God, the RH spiked and then it went down to 20% because there were Santa Ana's. If you're monitoring, at least you know that happened so that you can know, okay, it's time to, I need to go check my really sensitive artwork and make sure that they didn't get damaged during that incident, during that climate incident. Um, let's see. Uh, and then next slide. Oh, um, so when I was mentioning the idea of either controlling um, sort of your, whatever your problem RH is either through uh, storage or climate control, you know, I just wanna to touch on this idea of like microclimates and macroclimates. Um, it's just a way of thinking of like what you're dealing with so that you can sort of problem solve very effectively. They're very relative terms, but if, you know, like, um, depending on like what scale you're talking on. But generally you can sort of think of the macro environment as like the sum of like the overarching conditions. So for example, like the conditions in a building as a whole, you could call that a macro environment. Like this is what the conditions are just throughout this building. Um, so this building has an HVAC system. It doesn't have an HVAC system. It's an Adobe house. Oh, it's actually concrete block. It's wood frame, you know, all those things. Um, it's situated next to, you know, a lake, or it's in the middle of the Joshua tree forest, like all of that affects the macro environment. Um, and a lot of those things are, th are things that you can't control, right? Like, you can't control. I mean, we want to help our climate situation, but you know, um, that's not something that's easily solvable, but you can sort of control your micro environment, which is maybe the like, the folder or the box that you have your artwork stored in and um, whether you're going to have that wrapped in plastic and what part of the house you're going to put it in. Are you going to put it in a moldy leaky basement? Are you going to put it in a super hot dry attic? Where are you going to put it? Um, and uh, yeah, so those are just two ways to start thinking about how you have your artwork stored and like how to tweak its situation to best suit its particular material. Um, and uh, this is an example of an oxygen scavenger. So, you know, at our institution, we have these watches and they're all made of rubber plastic and it, they're deteriorating very badly because they have an inherent vice, right? We talked about inherent vice. These things are made of a plastic that's really poor quality and it's um, just, basically leaking out all these terrible plasticizers and it smells terrible. It's making the stuff around it. it, it it's affecting the things around it in addition to itself. So we segregated these, like set these aside from the rest of the collection and we built a box 
where that has this little compartment with the little vent holes you see in it. And we threw in these oxygen scavengers, which removed all the oxygen from the environment, which is, which is one of the ways that you can sort of slow down this degradation process is to remove all the, uh, it's, it's an oxidation process. So if you remove all the oxygen, it's gonna slow down that chemical process. It's like the only way you can really try to do that. So, you know, we built this box, throw in these oxygen scavengers and what those are, are these little packets that react with the air and there's little, there's, there's basically iron in there and it reacts with the air and it, it binds all, to the, all the oxygen atoms that are in the environment and makes it unavailable to, to anything in that same space, but it only works for a certain volume. So it has to be sealed in this box. And then the box itself is wrapped in marva steel, which is a vapor barrier. And that gets heat sealed up. So it's like this tiny little super duper um, sealed up microenvironment with little to no oxygen in there. And that's how we're trying to slow down and control um, the degradation of these particular watches. Okay, the next slide. Um, and so uh, here's a couple other sort of uh, items that we use when we're trying to control microenvironments. Um, silica gel, which someone was asking about. These are the little packets that you see sometimes in food packaging or when you buy like a leather bag, sometimes you know, pull up a little packet and it says, don't eat. Um, and that's a desiccant, it's usually silica gel. You can actually save those and recondition them. So like if it's, if it's like the Santa Ana's, if you want really dry silica gel, you can put it in your oven for super low heat, at super low heat for a couple hours, or like when it's the Santa Ana's, put them outside and let them dry out. If you need it to be more moist, put it in a humid bathroom, let it just become acclimate to the humidity of its environment. And then once it's at that humidity level that you want, you seal it up in a plastic bag. And then you can say like, I, you know, I, I condition these at 50% humidity. And the next time you need to store something, that you're worried about because it's going to go into a leaky basement, you know, store it in a bag, make sure the bag is super sealed in plastic and there's no like air gaps and throw in some of that silica gel you conditioned and hopefully that'll help keep the microclimate inside that space um, appropriate and, and safe. And then another additive you can, or another uh, item you can use is a scavenger. That's a picture of activated carbon, which, um, you know, some of you might recognize from Aquarium filters use activated carbon oftentimes to pull pollutants from uh, ammonia from aquarium water. Um, there are other types of materials like zeolite. I mean, a lot of times air filters will have activated carbon or zeolite incorporated into them to reduce odors because um, they're really good at um, absorbing um, vapors from the air, toxic vapors from the air. Um, and we did include sort of some resources Oh my goodness, we're going so late. <laughs> um, let's just finish up. <laughs> Plastics. Um, you guys can refer back to this later if you need. Um, it's a little bit off, but you know some plastics are better than others. I think the packing presentation is going to go over this in greater detail anyway, so let's just move on. Um, I did want to uh, mention one okay. thing uh -huh, about um, the propylene. Uh, plastic. Um, most people think that polypropylene is a good plastic and it's in a lot of museum collections and um, uh, you can purchase it from lots of people. Uh, but there was research recently uh, that did do aging of, of the plastic uh, and they did note that it did not do very well. Uh, um, and uh, I do not recommend using polypropylene. Uh, and you can, it's in everything. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm I'm a little shocked about that news too. I'm like, oh, we've got a lot of stuff in polypropylene. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but thankfully, polyethylene is okay still, and and you know that's usually what your Ziploc bags are made of. And it'll be written. It's the number one air, the air, the little triangle with the number one. And you can buy polyethylene sheeting to like wrap up your boxes in um, things like that. So uh, polyethylene is fine. Um, and we do use a lot of polyethylene with block bags at the museum for storage as well. Uh, emergency bins, something you might wanna think about having available. Um, you know, emergency can constitute anything, right? It's, uh, but you know, let's say 
you know, it's it, there's the first Pacific storm of the season and there's a leak in your closet where you have all your amazing stuff stored and um, you didn't know about it. This is the first rain for six months, you know, because it's dry all summer. And uh, thankfully you've got a bin with all these materials stashed so you have plastic sheeting you can throw over your boxes. You have some spillos you can put on the floor to absorb water. Um, and Aaron also pointed out earlier, like, you know, in particular water damage is, is something that's very time sensitive you have to deal with. Right, Aaron, if you wanted to. Oh, uh, yeah, you have uh, around uh, maybe three days uh, to get your artwork dry. Uh, so if you do have a leak in your uh, lab or your in whatever you're work working, um, you will need to dry everything. Uh, what happens is the chemicals in water that do prevent mold growth uh, start to evaporate um, and then uh, mold will start growing everywhere. And um, so, yeah, uh, usually when there is, there's like obvious over and circulation. Um, and uh, if there are questions, we can talk uh, more about it. Yeah. Someone mentioned scissors. Uh, also, sorry, thank you. Um, I wrote that on my list and forgot to put a picture of it on the slide, but yeah, you do need scissors and a packing knife and that pin to <laughs> have it actually be functional. Um, so, sorry, we can go to questions now. I mean, should we skip this risk assessment exercise, Uanya? What do you think? It's up to you. Um, we can also go over by a few minutes if, uh, if the audience has time, that, that's totally fine for us. Okay, um, I guess, well, I'll just read through this really quickly. So as, as an, you know, what we're trying to sort of explain what we mean by like risk assessment and sort of um, dealing with your particular situation since, you know, again, like we can't just give people a prescription because everyone's situation is very different. So, um, you know, if you're trying to assess your particular situation, you know, the first thing you can do is identify your goals and what available resources you have, characterize your setting, you know, like figure out this is this is my situation, this is what the microclimate is, this is what the macroclimate is, these are the risks to the kind of things that I have stored here. And then you need to analyze and then prioritize those risks and then try to make targeted um, changes to, you know, do the, the most you can with what you have. So for example, um, I'm going to pretend I'm a sculptor and I work in bronze and stone. All of my artwork that I've been working on for the last 10 years is temporarily stored out in the open, unpacked in a leaky garage. You know, I had to move out real quickly and everything's in this leaky garage that I'm borrowing from a friend. So the, my, uh, I'm going, my goal is to protect my work as best I can, but I only have a couple hundred dollars. So what can I do? Like, that doesn't seem like I can do much. Um, well, actually, Let's think about it because maybe you still can do quite a bit. Um, what are my risks? My, my risks are that winter is coming and the first storms in Los Angeles usually start in November. So dirty leak water will be bad. It can corrode my bronzes and stain light colored porous stones. And so that could be a, pro that's probably a priority. And there's various levels of fixes that maybe I can apply to that. So I've assessed that risk. Um, another risk, bug infestation. It's less of a priority, but you know, Rat poop could really mess up and stain some of my stones and, you know, rat pee can definitely cause corrosion on my bronzes. So it's maybe, um, it's, it's still a priority and, you know, it's something that I want to deal with. Bug infestation, I'm really not worried about. That's a super low priority for me. You know, fire would be bad, but I'm not in a wildfire prone area and I don't think there's any dangerous wiring that's exposed in the, in the garage. So I'm not going to worry about that so much. That's a lower priority. Lights aren't a problem for me because of the media that I've chosen. Chosen It's not light sensitive. So that's not something I'm gonna worry about right now. Temperature, I'm not concerned about, but relative humidity could be bad for the bronzes. But I actually put a ton of patina and wax on all my bronzes. So they're pretty okay, you know, cause I thought they were gonna be all displayed outside. Um, let's see, uh, theft would be pretty, theft would, be pretty hard for someone to steal large sculptures, but it could happen and there's no lock on the door. That's kind of maybe a, a medium priority for me, especially because that's easily fixed, right? So how, 
I can't afford to fix the, so let's assess what I can do. I can't afford to fix the garage because fixing the roof of a garage is kind of expensive. I can't afford to move everything to a storage unit. I don't have enough for that. So I'm gonna spend the money that I have on heavy duty plastic sheeting, polyethylene plastic sheeting, packing tape, and a really good padlock. And I'm gonna take a couple days off before November so that I can get everything wrapped up, sealed, and the door locked as quickly as I can before the first storm starts. So that would be uh, like an example of how you can deal with your situation. And I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much, um, Jan. Um, do you want to continue or, or should we move to questions? Uh, I like move to questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Thank you. I really loved your, your tip about the Celia gel because I always am like, do I throw these out? Do I not? I love the <laughs> I microclimates with bags. That's, that's great. Um, so it, just going through the, the chat, some of the previous questions. Um, uh, one of the participants mentioned that they work uh, with acrylic on wood and they're wondering if you have any um, specific materials that they could that they could use to uh, preserve or like mitigate against the risk of um, insect and, and pest infestation. Um, they mentioned like using plastic wrap, but like which one and is that going to cause its own series of problems? Yeah, so acrylic on wood. Um... I think your biggest risk is going to be, you know, a wood boring pest. Um, so polyethylene plastic sheeting is definitely something you can use to try and exclude that. But I would be careful in the way that you store it. I, I might consider having your works in a box before you wrap it in po po like polyethylene sheeting, because um, I have seen uh, that a lot where um, sometimes artists will wrap acrylic paints in particular, acrylic paintings in particular in plastic without like a collar or without a shadow, a shadow box that it sets into and the plastic will get stuck to the acrylic paint. So don't, don't let that plastic touch the acrylic paint directly but wrapping it, you know, maybe like in a, a shallow box or something like that you know, or just have like a completely closed up in a box and then wrapping the box itself in plastic and then, um, uh, you know, sealing it up very nicely with um, packing tape. And if you're gonna store it outside in a garage, you know, check on your packing tape because that packing tape fails over a period of time too, you know, like so after a rainy season, you're probably gonna have to rewrap it or something like that. There's um, uh, just on the topic of tape, there was some questions regarding um, this, you know, the scotch tape that you buy from an arts or craft store that's labeled acid free. Um, what are your opinions on that? Is that like use or, or is that like what, how we label things organic and it can mean many things? Yeah, Aaron, do you want to? Yeah, uh, I know I, I've thought a lot about tape and um, I guess my question is, what are you going to use it on? Uh, if you're gonna use it on your artwork, uh, maybe it might not be a good idea to use uh, tape. Um, rubber, rubber tape, like masking, masking tape is actually very bad and uh, will degrade very rapidly. Uh, the adhesive will oxidize and then uh, whatever you're sticking on your artwork will not uh, stay there for very long. Um, but the other, like 3M uh, uh, scotch, uh, scotch tapes are usually all right. Um, but yeah, like I said, it, uh, if you're just using it uh, on the outer area of your artwork, like you're wrapping something, uh, I would say that's definitely all right. Um, but if you're using it on your artwork, uh, you might want to think of a different uh, type of adhesive. Yeah. And, and similarly with um, double-sided tapes, are there some things to look out for? Uh, yeah, actually, so Jen, uh, I think she typed out a list of people who you can purchase things from. Uh, mm -hmm. You can um, buy ATG or uh, Scotch uh, 3M415, I think. And um, uh, so we do have a paper with all those uh, people you can purchase those things from. Uh, but in the museum world, uh, those are the, uh, I guess, the double-sided uh, tapes that we normally use. Uh, Jen, do you have anything that you recommend? Yeah, 
Well, no, we the, we use 4152. I know there's that conservation tape, but I don't see that being made anymore. So we just have been sticking with 4152. Oh, yeah. But again, this, yeah, we never use it on the artwork itself. It's just sort of to maybe build the box or um, help seal up the frame package that the artwork's being displayed in. Because yeah, as Aaron mentioned, like you, you don't want to use a pressure sensitive adhesive on the artwork itself if you can avoid it, um, because you know they're really not, um, they're not a forever type of material generally. Okay. Um, another question uh, regarding storage suggestions for water mixable oil paints on canvas. I'm not familiar with water mixable oils. Aaron, are you? No. <laughs> yeah, I could have uh, could have taken that down wrong. Um, whoever answered the question, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, you are welcome to do so. Um, if not, we can move on to another question. Uh, okay. If you too can recommend any natural protective sprays. <laughs> no, of eating from pests, right? I don't know of, of a spray. I mean, I wouldn't use a spray. We tend not to use a spray in collections areas at the Autry unless we're dealing with a really active infestation. There's nothing else we can do. And, and when we do use it, we try to take all the artwork out of there before we use it and let it sort of this the sort of vapors vapor off before we put the artwork back in. I, I think um, that the question is uh, is for like a protective barrier for pastels, like how to coat. Uh, oh, pastel! I thought you said pest. I'm sorry. Oh no, and I probably <laughs> I, <laughs> like a like a finish coat or something. A fixative seal. Mm -hmm. A fixative. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, we did a research um, project uh, many years ago on uh, UV filtering uh, sprays that would protect artwork, um, and actually none of them did very well, uh, even though they were made out of acrylates. Uh, after many, many years of aging, uh, they do darken. Um, and so if you do uh, are working with uh, media that's like graphite or uh, things that might offset very easily, uh, uh, usually I do not recommend uh, any type of fixative uh, for the object. Because uh, like I said, later on, uh, they will darken and then you'll actually in the artwork, there'll be areas of where the fixative was added. And uh, it is uh, theoretically possible to remove them, but um, yeah. I don't recommend any. Uh, and then if you have any um, suggestions for protecting encaustic works of art. Um, I think again, it, that's a sort of situation similar to the acrylic paint where if you are packing it, just have whatever is going over the surface raised off. Like, you know, that's just something, and you same with pastels, like you just can't have something directly touching your but you shouldn't have your packing material directly touching your artwork at all because it's you know it's just incredibly sticky medium um and i think they'll probably I mean, imagine they'll probably talk more about that too in the packing session like the best ways to build a shadow box or something like that to you know tent off the packing material so it's not in contact great um and any tips um regarding um ceramics for like protecting them when they're installed outside um the oh the, specifically thinking about water damage um water damage uh i mean you know anytime there's outdoor sculpture i really recommend people be mindful of where irrigation is happening um you know landscapers love to have lush grass around artwork for some reason but there's no way a sprinkler head is gonna stay where it's supposed to stay it always sprays onto the artwork and that's just tap water so there's a lot of dissolved solvents or I'm sorry dissolved salts not solvents dissolved salts in there and so you'll get you know like maybe like the hard water spots and then especially if you're dealing with a ceramic that's 
porous, I would worry about. You say glazed um, mid-range. I would still worry about that, that sort of tap water because if there's salts in the water, it'll stay in the ceramic. And then if you have like sudden changes in temperature, I could see spalling happening. Um, so, you know, I think rainwater I'd be less worried about, um, but irrigation water would definitely be the thing that I would make sure is just nowhere near there. Um, and then if you do clean it, clean it with filtered or distilled water. So you're not introducing any salts. Question on mold. Can you remove mold stain? Can they go? Uh, yes, uh, it is possible to do it. And uh, I actually work on that a lot. Uh, there was one image uh, in my presentation, which we didn't get to. Uh, that did show mold and uh, ideally you just don't have to remove it. Uh, and so if your uh, environment is underneath 60% uh, relative humidity, um, that would be sufficient uh, to prevent uh, mold growth and obviously water, uh, don't get water on your objects. Uh, related for pollutant mold pest uh, do you recommend vacuuming? Should yeah, um, carefully. <laughs> I have, um, like, if you have a vacuum with variable suction, that's ideal. Because then, you know, you know, like, if you, are they talking about a particular material? I'm sorry, I missed that part of the question. Uh, just, I mean, vacuum your storage with, with oxygen scavengers oh i see i see oh if you're if you were using an oxygen scavenger we do not pull a vacuum in that box i showed you because we're worried about the plastic closing in and damaging the artwork and crushing it so when when we do it at the museum we just put in enough scavengers so that the total volume is um effectively treated without pulling a vacuum but um mm, yeah is that, that if that's what they were asking? Uh, one of our artists is asking that her studio temperature is relatively very stable, but time to time I notice some mixed acrylic paints mixed with water and store bought acrylic paint, mostly blue, become moldy. I ended up storing them in the fridge. Is this a result of relative humidity? Have you had any experience with moldy acrylic paint? Erin, have you had that? Uh, no, I've never. Uh, well, I'm not a paintings conservator. I don't know if there is a paintings conservator uh, in this session, but maybe that person can speak up. But I've never personally. Have, yeah. I've seen mold grow on Let's Go, like 360 and 498. So like I've, I've seen mold grow on acrylic emulsions, not necessarily a paint, but um, yeah. I. I mean, is it the unused media that's getting moldy? I I try to buy paints in tubes instead of tubs because I feel like it's just less ex less exposure to the environment. So you're less likely to, it's less li likely to be getting damp from the environment and therefore, you know, like exacerbating or helping mold growth. I, I like tubes. It also doesn't dry out as fast. That's just me. I have a general question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about storing um, like clothing or paperwork around my apartment. Are there any storage bins that you, I, I know you, sh you showed in one of your slides like, like oh, a yeah. plastic bin, but then I've since learned that there are plastics and then there are plastics and you wanna, you wanna yeah. be aware for that, particularly for textiles, I think. I have, I don't know if you can see, I mean, I don't, I have my grandmother's dresses in a textile box up there. And I actually did, I had it in a polyethylene plastic bin that I had gotten from Ikea, but I wanted to change it because I just, you know, I didn't want to have to be checking on the state of the plastic to make sure that the plastic wasn't degrading. So I moved it into, um, blue board boxes and I have the blue board boxes wrapped in plastic 
So, you know, that was for me what I decided to do. There are certainly better plastics. I would look for polyethylene, like we mentioned. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I tend to try to get not colored plastics because I feel like sometimes they're like opaque plastics. There's maybe more filler and pigments. And I don't know if they're going to age as well as just like the unadulterated plastic. Erin, do you have an opinion on that or? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I just, yeah, polypropylene, just regular plastic I would use or polyethylene, mm -hmm. not polypropylene. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't, Jen, I think you, I don't know if we've mentioned, but your list of all the resources, I don't know where, can people get that? Yeah, so I will be sending um, that along with other um, PowerPoint slides and resource lists um, out after uh, Arts Tuneup has concluded, so. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know if we list a place that specifically does bins. I mean, you can get bins from anywhere. Like I said, I've, I've gotten bins from Ikea. I think the key is to make sure that the plastic is identified and that it's not a mixture. Like sometimes you'll hold up a plastic and there's like three numbers on it because it's a mix of all three plastics and you don't want that. You want it to just have the number one and it's all polyethylene. And then if the bin works for you, then, then that should be okay. Um, I like clear bins, like I said, but be aware then that lets light in. So I will have things inside the clear bin then wrapped um, if it's light sensitive like textiles. Um, so another thought. The, so the question about the um, oil water paints, uh, water miscible oil paints are new. So okay, I don't know if you've ever heard of those. I know Magdalena's on the call. Maybe she wants to chime in. Otherwise, we can ask our, our other session leaders or another paintings conservator too in, in another session and get that question answered. Yeah, I'm curious. I want to check it out now. <laughs> Water miscible oils. I have not heard of that. I missed that question. Oh, Magdalena says that she's seen paintings get moldy. This is with water damage or extremely humid environments. So it might depend on the binder of the paint. So Magdalena, do you think that freezing is okay? Um, well, at that point, you're you're getting uh, you're getting the temperature extremely. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a pretty extreme temperature. But um, um, and I mean, it's interesting. I would I would rather. I I would have to see. I don't know. I would have to see the painting. I think, but um, uh, usually you don't really. Um, uh do do freezing for uh for, for paintings but it's um keeping it in a colder environment would probably be better but um but yeah yeah well, I, we don't really freeze at a museum either for mold you know because it just all it does is sort of make it dormant it doesn't really get rid of it i think the key would be um removing all the excess moisture with a desiccant you mentioned earlier um if artists works with found materials, um, you know, making sure before they start working with them that they're clean um, and free of like debris or, or pests, obviously. But if the artist had space available, is that something and they're like textiles that they could freeze maybe as like a preventative measure? Yeah, I mean, you could get like a sub-zero chest freezer for a few thousand dollars, I guess. I, I'm thinking um, like like the oh. freezer that we have attached to our fridge. Oh, <laughs> um, it, you know, you have to get for it would work on certain materials. Like if you're only worried about moths because of clothes, maybe if you stuck it in the freezer, it might work. But in order to kill like eggs and beetles, it has to be like minus thirty. Okay. For like three days at least, which is hard to get to. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the rub. Um, you can do heat for some materials though. I, you know, like my, my go-to method for preventative, I'm always afraid of bed bugs when I travel back when we used to be able to travel. And so I always leave my suitcase in my car for three days on three really hot days. And the greenhouse effect raises the temperature high enough that it kills pests. So if your material can withstand some heat, 
you could you could do that so you could just yeah put stuff in your car as a yeah let it get really hot yeah. and then for a few days in the summer and <laughs> I love that you know like I think to kill a bug with cold you have to bring the cold temperature down really really far but to kill a bug with heat it only needs to go a little bit up the problem is that it, like it's more hazardous to materials to raise the heat than to bring down to the cold if that makes sense mm -hmm. so thank you both i think we've gotten through all the the questions in the chat um and as brianna said we're going to have resources available for participants later and and aaron and jen did provide us with full lists of resources um to to seek out after this presentation so thank you again. And these are the sessions for today. Um, join us. We have one session tomorrow, which is uh, less technical than the ones today with Shannon um, talking about the artist conservator relationship. And then we'll return Friday with three more sessions. So we hope you can come back and join us. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you everybody for tuning in. See you tomorrow.